One minute, I think. Mm. Yeah, Facebook is on live. So uh, let me to, to greet uh, all participants of this event. So we, I'm talking from now uh, from uh, the Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies uh, from Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, and I am Kaha Gogolashvili, senior fellow of this foundation. Uh, and uh, I will be moderating this meeting. Uh, our guest, uh, uh, honorable guest is uh, Mr. Sergei Utkin, Dr. Sergei Utkin, who represents Moscow uh, Institute of uh, International Relations uh, of, oh, oh, sorry, uh, Institute of uh, Economy and uh, International Relations. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, this is um, a very important um, Russian, you know, the, this is very important Russian uh, establishment. And uh, uh, our expert, Mr. Sergei Utkin, is a very well known Russian expert who participated in many. Uh, not only because of his research uh, capabilities and because of, uh, of uh, what he has done uh, as academic in uh, academic uh, field, but also as practical participant in many uh, dialogue meetings. Uh, uh, also participate, he participated, he took part in uh, the uh, Georgian Russian experts dialogue for several years. Uh, which was conducted by GFSIS. Uh, and he also took part in many other uh, similar meetings. So he has practical experience of exchanging views with uh, international experts, including experts from the region, from the region of South Caucasus. And uh, so uh, shortly, he's, uh, as he is uh, main speaker of our uh, meeting, uh, at our meeting, so I will shortly introduce his bio. She's, uh, since 2016, he had strategic assessment section at the Primakov Institute of World Economy and International Relations, uh, Russian Academy of Science. From 2016 till June 2018, he also headed foreign and security policy department at the Moscow-based Center for Strategic Research. In 2012, 2016, he worked at the Center for Situation Analysis, Russian Academy of Science and now merged with IMEMO. Uh, and uh, since 2006, 2013, he worked at IMEMO, where his last position was head of section for political aspects of European integration. So I, I want to also to, to mention that he's a quite a famous expert on EU-Russia relations and author of uh, interesting uh, uh, projects and suggestions regarding the improvements of, of this relation. So let me to, uh, to go to the subject of our meeting directly now. So as you know, this is uh, uh, related to Karabakh. Uh, and as far as we have Russian experts here, it would be really uh, wise from our side, uh, first of all, to, to ask and to concentrate about uh, uh, Russia's policy in all this, so in, in the Karabakh uh, conflict settlement, around it, the ceasefire agreement, uh, in general, Russia's interest in the region, uh, Russia's involvement in uh, South uh, uh, Caucasian uh, countries, uh, and uh, what, what the participation in, in uh, this Karabakh settlement or ceasefire uh, facilitation of the ceasefire means for Russia uh, as, a, as an actor, as, a, as an international actor in this region, or as a regional power. So many other questions probably could be right. We, we could also talk about uh, uh, the outcomes of, of this ceasefire agreement, of the war itself, uh, for Armenia, for Azerbaijan, uh, for Russia, for other countries of the region. First of all, Turkey, I think, who took quite uh, uh, important role, um, not as important as Russia saying uh, directly, but uh, quite uh, important role, maybe not in conflict itself. In conflict, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, to our view, took quite active role. Uh, 
at least uh, supporting Azerbaijan uh, militarily in terms of supplying arms and uh, helping uh, to retrain army, to develop uh, military capacities, etc., but also politically supporting Azerbaijan. But uh, in the same time, of course, Russia was more active in, in, the, in the settlement of the conflict itself. Uh, it's not, uh, sorry, not settlement of the conflict as far as conflict is not settled, but um, uh, stopping of, uh, uh, or resuming the uh, armed uh, confrontation and uh, uh, the war itself stopping. And uh, also other actors like Georgia, for example, regional actor who, or regional uh, country who is very much interested uh, in, uh, in situation and uh, most probably uh, the new realities in South Caucasus will have impact on Georgia as well and uh, not only on Georgia's <clears throat> relations with Azerbaijan, Armenia, and uh, uh, all this, but also its relations with Russia, is, uh, the new realities may give to Russia the new uh, vision of its involvement in South Caucasus that could be damageable for Georgia, or we don't know exactly what will uh, come out from all this. But in any case, uh, this is uh, a matter of concern and interest from side of Georgian audience and Georgian experts and Georgian uh, politicians and population in general of Georgia. So uh, let's us also to, to think about other, to other issues. For example, it was very, uh, I would say, uh, explicitly, um, uh, we can see, clearly, clearly the result uh, of this is fire is the diminishing uh, role of uh, other actors uh, previously involved in uh, the Karabakh uh, uh, settlement like France and the US in particular, but EU in general and uh, uh, international community, uh, OEC as an organization or other international organizations or so were uh, directly or indirectly involved in certain activities around this uh, uh, Karabakh conflict attempts to settle the Karabakh conflict. And uh, this ceasefire which was reached under facilitation of Russian uh, uh, government, of course, uh, changed. Uh, it, it came as a game changer, I would say. It changed some uh, uh, realities and uh, the role of all these actors, all other actors. So we are looking also for, to the future um, uh, re, uh, res, resettlement of all these uh, uh, participatory uh, actors and uh, their role in, 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 in the new situation. So I know that France, for example, already expressed some uh, new ambitions about the uh, participation in the settlement itself of the conflict. And also, uh, <clears throat> also there, was, uh, uh, there were some declarations regarding the OEC Minsk group to joining again and also de deciding together and not Russia acting unilaterally uh, from, from, this, from this momentum. So uh, during, uh, during our session, we will try, of, of course, to, to touch upon all other questions, which could be interesting for our speaker and uh, which, which he thinks it's important to, to mention and uh, to talk about. And uh, also I will ask uh, the participants to send uh, uh, their questions on uh, Q&A. Uh, there is such a, uh, such a box, uh, as you know. Uh, 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 this on this Zoom facility. So to send their questions in Q and A that we can see and uh, communicate to our speaker in order so that he's able to to respond directly the, the uh, to satisfy directly the interest of, of our uh, participants. So uh, thank you. Uh, so that was small uh, short introduction from my side. And now I will ask uh, our speaker uh, uh, Sergey. Uh, I can say, uh, I, I hope uh, I can address you by name as far as I know you quite a lot of time and you uh, can address me just Kaha. So uh, please, Sergey, uh, start your presentation which uh, shall last 10, 15 minutes, I guess. And uh, please talk about the main important topics that you consider uh, necessary to communicate to our, our audience. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kaha. Uh, I'll try to keep my introductory remarks short, and uh, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to discuss this topic because uh, I understand that, of course, uh, my angle uh, is just uh, one of many angles that you can look at this uh, situation from. Um, this is uh, an angle of a Moscow-based analyst uh, who is dealing with the larger topics of, in, uh, of European security, of uh, European foreign policy. And uh, uh, of course, when you are based in this region, when you live in South Caucasus, you uh, have a different angle. And uh, I hope that uh, today we will have not just a Q&A, but uh, a true conversation where um, I will be able to hear other uh, views and opinions as well, even in a short form that uh, we will have time for. Um, so uh, to uh, keep my remarks short, I highlighted uh, five points that I want to concentrate on. Um, first, uh, um, I did follow the developments around um, Karabakh because of the importance that this conflict uh, played uh, for the uh, European security, for the regional security for uh, quite many years. Um, of course, uh, my expertise on that, again, is uh, not the one that uh, uh, people who just deal with this uh, conflict all the time uh, have, uh, but uh, I uh, had an impression of uh, uh, how the discussion around this conflict develops. I had an impression of uh, what kind of opportunities for the conflict resolution uh, being, are being forged by, by the sides and world. And uh, uh, the uh, general bottom line that I can uh, see here, sort of the conclusion that uh, one can come to uh, when uh, you look at the conflict at its development, is that it is uh, uh, pretty much a political minefield. So basically, it's uh, very hard to um, uh, have any opinion that will not be instrumentalized uh, by this or that side uh, in its favor. Uh, it's, it's very hard to uh, touch uh, this, this subject uh, without um, um, offending uh, some strong opinions that exist on uh, this or that side. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that this is a minefield uh, means that we should be very careful when uh, we even uh, discuss uh, this conflict in the academic field. Uh, we should understand that uh, the uh, emotions, the, the emotions, the political interests that um, are behind uh, the positions of each side are very strong and uh, very sincere also. And uh, that uh, these feelings, these uh, um, uh, tragedies and histories that are behind each of the positions, uh, they have to be respected. Um, unfortunately, uh, at this point, uh, when uh, uh, the uh, conflict moved in a different phase, and you even heard from a number of uh, Russian officials uh, that uh, uh, we should probably stop talking about uh, Karabakh conflict, that uh, uh, we should start uh, talking about conflict as being resolved, but I, I'm afraid it's, it's uh, kind of premature uh, to uh, speak about it as a result. But definitely, the conflict moved in a different in a different stage, and um, uh, this uh, uh, created a kind of a peak of uh, opinionated assessments. Uh, you had uh, all sorts of um, op-ed writers uh, feeling obliged to write something about the topic that they never really dealt with uh, for a long time, uh, and uh, this produced an avalanche of very strong opinions on uh, uh, who gained, who lost, uh, who is the winner, who is the loser, who is uh, um, uh, the one who determines the rules of the game here, and, and so on. Uh, I think much of that is uh, uh, oversimplification that is not helpful. Uh, much of that is sort of uh, reducing this uh, very complex conflict and the very complex environment to um, uh, geopolitical zero-sum game, and uh, very often at the expense of uh, um, attention that has to be paid to the way people live in this uh, conflict area and uh, uh, what uh, will the future be for those people. 
So uh, I think what we definitely shouldn't do is sort of uh, trying to uh, dance in this minefield. Uh, and uh, this is uh, what we see many people are actually doing or urge others to do. Uh, my second point is that um, um, what uh, uh, probably not everybody noticed, but I think a uh, number of people who follow the conflict noticed, uh, is uh, a pretty moderate uh, position of uh, uh, Georgia in all of that. Uh, probably some people wanted uh, this position to be a different one, and uh, this is understandable because, of course, uh, Georgia has a very complicated relationship with Russia and basically the absence of diplomatic relations. And uh, all of that uh, is um, uh, by no means forgotten by Georgian political leadership. And nevertheless, um, uh, Georgia decided to uh, grant the ability uh, of uh, flyover uh, over Georgian territory for uh, the Russian peacekeepers uh, uh, arriving to uh, Karabakh. Uh, and uh, uh, I understand that uh, this created sort of mixed feelings uh, in some Georgian audiences. Um, but um, uh, I think this is uh, uh, a signal uh, that uh, um, Georgia here exercises a responsible uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the conflict that it uh, doesn't want to escal escalate further, uh, that uh, any further escalation in Karabakh would be also detrimental for Georgia, for uh, the broader region. And if uh, um, this um, uh, ceasefire agreement uh, uh, was uh, uh, supported by the parties of the conflict and by Russia, and this is uh, the only possible solution for the time being, then uh, Georgia was uh, ready to uh, play its part, and uh, this, I think, is is a, is a sign that uh, everybody in the region uh, is uh, interested in um, uh, stopping the bloodshed and um, getting back to uh, the uh, negotiations and further details of uh, what will be happening in this uh, conflict area. Um, the uh, third point that I want to make is about the peacekeeping. Uh, the peacekeeping is always a tricky task. It's not an easy uh, run, and um, uh, we all understand that uh, the peacekeeping contingent, uh, the uh, troops on the ground, so to say, uh, they are not uh, the kind of troops that can become an independent party and, uh, well, have intention to become an independent party uh, in this uh, conflict. By no means uh, uh, they have uh, that kind of task. Uh, on the contrary, the contingent is limited. Uh, it's uh, less than 2,000 people. Uh, even if they have all sorts of technical support, it's, uh, uh, it's a relatively small number. And uh, uh, their task is indeed to ensure the ceasefire, uh, to uh, make sure that uh, uh, people on the ground in the conflict region, they have uh, uh, someone to talk to, someone to reach out to without uh, seeing those people as enemies. And uh, we know that uh, between the conflict parties, uh, the uh, animosity is very strong. So there was a necessity to have uh, some kind of mediator, some uh, um, uh, kind of um, uh, people on the ground that you can uh, reach out to and uh, talk to. Um, so these will be the peacekeepers. Uh, this is a very difficult task because uh, there are all sorts of um, uh, provocation possible. Of course, uh, there are all sorts of uh, activities that will almost inevitably like demining and uh, uh, these sort of things uh, inevitably will involve um, um, some casualties, even if limited. Um, but um, uh, this is the task that uh, uh, Russia was ready to accept. And uh, probably one of the uh, reasons uh, was that um, indeed, uh, given the uh, bad uh, kind of relationship that you currently have between Russia and the West. Uh, and uh, well, uh, even uh, if we uh, try to exercise some diplomatic talk, they, they have to be um, called as uh, uh, far, from, uh, far from constructive kind of relationship. Uh, you uh, had it much easier for Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan 
uh, to negotiate this deal just trilaterally rather than to reach out to bigger international frameworks, be it uh, the OSC Minsk group or others. Uh, and uh, Russia was ready for that. Uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia were ready for that. Um, so this happened to be the sort of simplest and uh, uh, the solution that uh, each of the sides involved was uh, ready to accept and was ready to play its part in that. Um, whether uh, this uh, will remain the case in the longer run or we will have uh, uh, other uh, actors uh, involved in uh, uh, the uh, solution seeking uh, is uh, what we will have to see in uh, uh, the months uh, and probably years to come. And uh, uh, this is what I uh, want to uh, talk about in my fourth point. Uh, and the fourth point is about humanitarian and economic issues, which uh, sort of make part of this ceasefire deal. Um, you have it as uh, uh, mostly as uh, the last point in the uh, trilateral uh, statement by uh, the presidents of Russia and Azerbaijan and the prime minister of Armenia, um, uh, which is uh, that all the economic communications in the region have to be restored. And uh, frankly, it's easier to say that than to do that, because, of course, uh, all mm -hmm. these uh, uh, political clashes, this animosity that you have uh, uh, between the parties of the conflict and also, well, say, between uh, Armenia and Turkey, uh, they will all play a role here. And the question that I ask myself, and I think that will have to be looked at very carefully, uh, whether indeed that will be possible to use uh, uh, this moment, uh, which is of course very painful for Armenia, um, uh, to uh, restore economic communication and to make it also benefit uh, the Armenian economy, uh, which uh, uh, has remained uh, um, isolated from the Turkish side and uh, the Azerbaijan side for a long time, uh, whether it will be politically acceptable for Armenia to restore this economic communication, because of course we understand that uh, this um, uh, animosity doesn't go away just because we get to this other stage of the conflict. Uh, these are the questions that I ask myself, and uh, I think it will be very important to uh, look at that in detail and to see whether we can use this economic engine, uh, the restoration of economic communication, uh, as a way to um, create a more peaceful atmosphere for everybody who is living in this region. And uh, the role will be crucial here of uh, international organizations, uh, which has already been highlighted by um, Russian officials that they would love to have uh, the Red Cross, uh, the UN agencies, uh, the uh, UNESCO that uh, is uh, caring about uh, the uh, state of the world heritage, the cultural monuments, uh, to, to, to all be present in this uh, conflict area and to play their role, uh, to play their part. Uh, um, uh, this could also be the role of the Minsk group uh, that sort of uh, was indeed uh, for a uh, time being sidelined uh, because uh, the ceasefire had to be concluded uh, at a very fast pace, otherwise uh, it, uh, the, the, the continuation of the conflict could um, uh, lead to a further bloodshed. Uh, but uh, now I think the further, further role for the Minsk group is not excluded. Of course, you do have all sorts of tensions, not just uh, because of the, say, the Russian attitude to, um, to the West at this, uh, at this moment, but also because of uh, the reaction you have on the Azerbaijan side uh, to uh, the steps you now see in France, uh, sort of in favor of Armenia, and we know that um, uh, there is a, a rather significant number of Armenians who live in France, and of course uh, they also uh, care about what happens uh, uh, around this conflict and what happens to Armenia in the future. Um, so there are all sorts of uh, uh, tensions to contribute to the disagreements that are, already exist, but still, I think uh, international brokers uh, will be able to play a role uh, in uh, um, uh, the uh, rapprochement that should happen in the region. Uh, basically, unless you uh, make sure that indeed um, the parties of the conflict, they feel uh, there is an added value for them in this new situation when they will be able to use the involvement of international community and uh, uh, the economic uh, interaction that they couldn't use at the previous stage, 
um, unless we ensure that they feel that they can benefit uh, from uh, this international involvement, uh, they would uh, again get to um, another uh, stage of the conflict instead of uh, any kind of rapprochement. So this has to be uh, kept in mind and uh, looked at very carefully uh, by all people who want to help the conflict resolution. And the last point that I wanted to make uh, is that, um, um, uh, well, um, as, uh, as I already mentioned, this is still a minefield, so we still have to be very careful with uh, every step, step we make. Uh, and uh, uh, what we uh, witnessed just recently when uh, the uh, ceasefire uh, has been already brokered uh, was that um, uh, for many countries uh, in the world, um, the South Caucasus is still sort of a marginal field. Uh, I mean, it's probably uh, a bit uncomfortable to accept, but uh, even many uh, Western countries that uh, uh, paid uh, relatively a lot of attention to what happened in the South, Ca uh, South Caucasus, uh, they uh, were very uh, much ready to marginalize those developments around Karabakh. Uh, France is probably an exception in this uh, in this regard. They still uh, uh, care about what happen you know, what happens there. But uh, for uh, many major uh, Western media, for major uh, Western uh, mainstream uh, um, political forces, uh, that was not a big deal. In spite of the fact that that, that for people who look at the South Caucasus closely. Uh, what happened around Karabakh is probably one of the most uh, significant historical shifts uh, that happened uh, in um, uh, a decade or so. Um, in spite of that, uh, this all remains very marginal for many, many countries. And that means that uh, those countries that do care about the developments in the South Caucasus, the sort of regional powers, uh, they have to be uh, very responsible and very careful with what they do, because unless they are, unless they are responsible and careful, uh, this conflict still can um, become a cradle of um, um, a regional power game that uh, will only make people of the region suffer more and more. Uh, this is uh, the worst, say, worst case scenario that has to be avoided, and to, to do that, we should probably, for the time being, concentrate on the possibilities to deliver uh, humanitarian aid and to restore those economic ties in the conflict area that um, were pledged by the ceasefire agreement. Well, thank you very much, Sergei. Uh, you touched upon uh, six or seven uh, questions, uh, all very interesting. and. Uh, I, I, I understand your position is uh, uh, focusing the attention, first of all, on uh, the humanitarian dimension of this uh, conflict as such. So uh, first, uh, to, uh, your priority is uh, to stop bloodshed and stop uh, killing. Uh, so to stabilize the uh, region, relations, then economic opening and the possibility for Armenia also to integrate into, into regional uh, economies and uh, open, uh, <clears throat> open uh, the uh, communications. Then uh, Russia's role, you see, I see, at least you see Russia's role as, as a uh, power which, which should uh, limit itself with the aims of establishing peace in this region and not monopolizing the space. So allowing also international actors to participate, uh, which, uh, which uh, probably could be my question, whether Russia would be interested to allow international actors to participate more actively in the process. Uh, so uh, uh, not only Turkey, usually we think about Turkey and when uh, Everybody asks whether the Russia really allows Turkey to, to play more important role in, in this region. Uh, we see now that Turkey is uh, starting stationing its, uh, its troops uh, in Azerbaijan. We don't know exactly how much and would it be the, the equivalent uh, to, to the uh, quantity that Russian peacekeepers uh, deploy there. 
but still uh, they will not be deployed in Karabakh itself. Uh, they will be deployed on Azeri, Azerbaijani land, but still uh, we can imagine that in this situation, NATO member state, if we stop talking about only regional, uh, so interest, etc. Also, uh, NATO member state deploys its troops in South Caucasus. This is first time, actually. It's not in the name of NATO. We, this is understandable, of course, and uh, it doesn't pursue interest directly of the NATO, but still, Turkey is a member of NATO. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is, of course, absolutely new, uh, everything in this. Uh, whether we, if we, if we, uh, if we witness change of Russia's attitude towards the region, uh, from uh, which we were seeing before, at least this is my opinion. Now, maybe you don't agree, but I was seeing that it was trying. Russia was, or she was trying, to monopolize the the uh, the, the relations and influence in South Caucasus, uh, trying to to get more stronger step in this region than than any other actor. So, uh, but uh, according to your vision, to, I, I see that Russia should be interested in, uh, first of all, in stabilizing the situation and uh, uh, playing the role of real, real peacemaker in the region, also allowing international organizations and other actors to participate. Here, of course, uh, there are several questions which, which the audience already um, sent to us. Uh, some questions relate about exactly about participation of the West, and uh, in, in particular, uh, what the new administration, Biden's administration, uh, according to your, your views, can take, what kind of position can take uh, towards this conflict. You already said that the conflict is a bit marginalized and the region is a little bit marginalized from side of the big powers. Uh, but uh, do you expect that the Biden's administration will play more and more active role? Uh, and uh, this will imply, of course, talks with Russia and with Turkey also, but with uh, reg uh, regional states uh, uh, themselves uh, without doubt. And uh, I would also ask about more uh, 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 about your opinion. Uh, the conflict was not actually solved. Uh, uh, what happened, to my view, this was uh, uh, the realization, uh, but through the war, of uh, practically of Madrid principles, uh, near, nearby, nearby, of the Madrid summit principles, not fully, uh, because Madrid principles supposed uh, returning the seven regions to first five regions, which, which were purely other regions, other populated regions, and two other regions which were partially occupied by uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenian forces uh, later. And then uh, uh, talks about status of Nagorno-Karabakh, talks about the uh, 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 through, through plebiscite, through the referendum, and then deciding about the status, which could have implied, I think, uh, the independence of this region. But it was uh, considered in, in the borders of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh Oblast. Uh, for the moment, we see the situation. If I show the map, actually, uh, let me to, to, to make it. Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, some technical problems. Uh, yeah, and uh, I will show the map here. Uh, I think uh, you can see the map, right? Uh, yeah, we see here on, on this map, we see here uh, the, uh, from the right side, this is map before the, before the last war. Uh, and we see the seven regions which were occupied ex, uh, extra Karabakh regions, I would say, which were occupied in addition to the Karabakh by Armenian forces, uh, and uh, which were populated uh, in 99% populated by Armenians predominantly. Uh, maybe five regions by 99%, but two regions like Agdam and uh, Fizuli, they were occupied by mixed population, but still a majority, as I know, where Azeri is there. So this region should have been returned according to different plans, including the Lavrov plan, which was uh, pre presented in 2013, and the previous Pashinyan's previous government 
uh, of, Azer of Armenia was practically uh, agreeing and uh, trying to, uh, to follow these advices and uh, was ready to participate in negotiations around it. But unfortunately, pa Pashinyan stopped these negotiations around it. And uh, what we see now, now we see that practically all uh, these seven regions uh, were returned to, to Azerbaijan, some of them by force, some others uh, as a result of ceasefire agreement uh, around Karabakh. And uh, this is Karabakh, which I show on the map uh, itself, Karabakh itself. And here, just the territories in green were uh, taken by uh, Azerbaijani military forces on the north, small territory, and also uh, two important cities, I think, uh, Hadrut and uh, the Shusha is the most important city. Uh, and now situation is a little bit more uh, worse for Armenian side. But still, uh, if, uh, uh, if the negotiations under the uh, OEC auspices continue, then uh, the plan of uh, recognizing independence of Karabakh can be returned in this situation. Of course, Azerbaijan now is a winner and it will not uh, easily go to this, uh, to this uh, of course, um, uh, conditions. But my question will be regarding this, that will be Russia interested uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I want to come back to this um, uh, meeting control, to come back to the meeting. Yeah. Uh, I cannot leave easily this map, I'm very sorry. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, anyway, my, my question will be here that uh, would be Russia easily convinced to continue this kind of negotiations between Azerbaijan and Armenia and to allow, to allow uh, the parties uh, under auspices of OEC to uh, uh, finally to uh, start negotiation on uh, continuation of this plan, which was presented by Madrid summit in 2007, and then uh, which was presented by Lavrov also, uh, more or less the same type of plan uh, in 2013. So. Uh, or you think that Russia will be more interested to keep the status quo? So in order to keep its, uh, um, uh, its influence in, in, in both countries, because the situation is that uh, with, with this situation, which we have now, Russia has leverage on both countries. Uh, I, I will not go to details. Uh, this is passage from uh, uh, Azerbaijan to Nakhchivan, and this is passage uh, through Lachin corridor from Karabakh to Armenia, etc. And, and also other, other things that give leverage to Russia to keep control over these countries. Uh, but in case they agree on solution regarding Nagorni Karabakh, which is reduced now uh, in, in, the, in these borders, uh, uh, in the smaller borders that it was before the war, uh, if Russia agrees on this kind of uh, uh, this kind of um, outcome uh, and uh, helps uh, facilitate the starting real negotiations for real settlement. What do you think about this? Well, I'd say uh, Russia for a long time tried to uh, keep um, good relations with both Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, which was uh, not an easy task given uh, the relationship between the two. Uh, and uh, of course, there were very often uh, people on each side that uh, sort of made reproaches to Russia that uh, any uh, offer made to the other side is sort of uh, not appropriate. Uh, but um, um, that has been the Russian position. And in this regard, I think uh, what you have uh, and what you have had uh, around Karabakh is uh, sort of different. Uh, from what you had um, in um, other frozen conflicts in the post-Soviet. Um, 
of course, for every frozen conflict, you have a sort of a official position of uh, Russia that uh, explains to you uh, why um, Russian policies are such as they are. But still, uh, the fact of the matter is that other um, frozen conflicts, uh, uh, they actually created um, uh, deep animosity towards Russia in uh, other frozen conflict zones by some actor, like uh, the kind of, uh, uh, so to say, difficult relationship that uh, we have between uh, Russia and Georgia. Um, but uh, uh, in the uh, case of Karabakh, uh, you uh, had um, uh, Karabakh Armenians relying not on Russia, but on Armenia. And Armenia has been fully aware uh, that uh, if it comes to the escalation or when it comes to the escalation, because I think uh, the fact that uh, escalation uh, uh, had to happen earlier or later was uh, not a surprise for most uh, of the observers. Um, Armenia was uh, uh, fully aware that uh, it will be the task of uh, Armenia, even if you like a national cause as they see it, uh, to uh, defend their cause, uh, to uh, defend this area. And uh, they were determined to, uh, uh, to uh, be successful in that. Um, so basically what you could hear uh, many times was that, uh, well, uh, we won uh, the war in the 90s and uh, if there is a, a military attempt, uh, uh, we uh, will uh, win again. Yes, uh, so this was uh, uh, the Armenian vision. And uh, uh, of course they understood that say the CSTO mechanisms, uh, they uh, were for Armenia proper and not for uh, any developments around Karabakh. Um, so the, 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 these were not the guarantees for Karabakh and uh, this was uh, clearly expressed and clearly understood also by Armenia. Um, and in this sense, uh, um, I think uh, what we have uh, after uh, this uh, war and in this new uh, state of affairs that emerged from the war uh, is that again, I think the uh, Russian intention, um, I unlike maybe in some other areas, uh, will be to maintain a constructive relationship uh, with different parties, even if they um, don't keep uh, good relations with each other. Uh, to uh, work as a kind of a balance here uh, that uh, can be able to uh, reach out to uh, very different people. Um, probably you can see uh, sort of a similarity in uh, Russian policies in the Middle East, uh, where a number of countries also pretty much hate each other, but uh, they do talk to Russia and uh, uh, Russia is able to play a role in the region. Uh, in uh, this case, I think uh, also when it comes to Turkey, um, the attitude to Turkey is not just as to any other NATO member and not primarily as a NATO member because we understand that Turkey is by now sort of a uh, um, difficult partner for some NATO countries uh, because uh, Turkey pursues its own uh, regional interests and uh, uh, that is uh, not what makes uh, some NATO countries other NATO countries happy. Um, but uh, for Russia, uh, Turkey is a kind of a constanta in the region. So you uh, cannot uh, think of this uh, region without Turkey. Turkey has always been present there and it uh, will remain present. In terms of uh, um, cooperation between Azerbaijan and Turkey, uh, this cooperation was by no means blocked by uh, the state of affairs as it existed before the war. So you couldn't uh, prohibit Azerbaijan to uh, work with Turkey, uh, with Turkey also in the military field. Um, and you cannot prohibit it uh, uh, now. I think uh, while, of course, you have to uh, keep in mind the uh, political uh, weight of Russia, uh, you shouldn't think about the Russian role as the one, as the one that decides uh, the realities in each countries of the region. Uh, we uh, actually saw across the post-Soviet that uh, certain uh, Russian preferences uh, were not uh, determining uh, the um, 
a political process in certain countries. You just had uh, elections in uh, countries so far away from each other as uh, Kyrgyzstan and uh, Moldova. And uh, these uh, did not develop in accordance with the uh, Russian preferences. Um, uh, so now you have very turbulent uh, political process in Armenia. And uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, Russian preferences will again uh, determine the outcome of this uh, of this very turbulent political process. Mm -hmm. um, so this uh, goes for every country. They they do have their sovereign uh, right to decide what's what's good for them. And uh, certainly, Azerbaijan wants to keep cooperating with Turkey. On the one hand, on the other, I think uh, Azerbaijan doesn't want to uh, turn into sort of. Um, continuation of Turkey in the South Caucasus. They want to keep their sovereign rights. Uh, they want to keep their sovereign uh, foreign policy. And uh, um, however they see uh, the uh, Turkish and other people as uh, sort of brotherly peoples, um, uh, they would still want to keep their autonomy in their uh, decisions, including in the military field. Uh, that means that uh, Azerbaijan might also be interested in uh, keeping Turkish involvement at a certain level, not to exclude Turkey, but also to uh, keep it uh, below a certain threshold that uh, would uh, uh, change the um, military realities to an extent that would probably be unfavorable also to uh, Azerbaijan. Uh, as to uh, Turkish presence, I understand that uh, you had a number of uh, uh, very uh, detailed uh, phone calls uh, between Putin and uh, uh, Erdogan on the issue. Uh, and uh, uh, that Russian vision of uh, what will be happening next is that there should be a center for the monitoring of ceasefire that uh, would include some Turkish officers as observers. Uh, and uh, along with that, you could have, uh, of course, uh, Turkish sort of bilateral cooperation with Azerbaijan uh, that uh, would probably also concern the restoration of the areas that Azerbaijan got under its control. Uh, so the Turkish role will definitely play a role, but uh, the, the Turkey will definitely play a role. But uh, uh, I think uh, uh, this will not necessarily uh, create uh, conflicts with Russia. Of course. Uh, uh, there are risks here, but uh, the Russian intention will be to uh, maintain uh, close communication and cooperation with Turkey as well. Um, on Biden's administration, uh, this is an interesting point, of course, and uh, I think indeed uh, the fact that uh, the U.S., uh, given the very messy political campaign, uh, the, the, the elections in, in the United States, they, they were sort of... Uh, uh, excluded from the process uh, at their own will. Um, I think uh, uh, this uh, will probably not be exactly the case uh, during the Biden's administration uh, that uh, most people expect to uh, come to the White House next year. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think we should expect uh, too much attention uh, on the part of the U.S. to specifically this conflict. Uh, actually, I think uh, uh, Biden's administration in uh, uh, their sort of uh, Atlanticist, if you like, vision of uh, uh, relationship with Europe, um, they will probably uh, pay more attention to developments uh, um, around Georgia and the support to Georgia that has uh, always been pledged by the Atlanticist uh, uh, voices in the U.S. are rather than to uh, this development around Karabakh, because uh, uh, well, probably not everybody is completely happy with this ceasefire agreement. Uh, but uh, I think uh, you have very little number of people in in the West uh, who would love this uh, uh, conflict to um, escalate again. Um, so, however, they have uh, reservations to the Russian role, to the ceasefire, uh, they still want uh, uh, further escalation to be prevented. And uh, this is uh, probably the good ground for, uh, for um, uh, Russia and the US to talk in a constructive manner on what uh, happens in this uh, area further. Um, on status issues, uh, uh, this is indeed the most complicated part. 
Uh, and um, uh, here, uh, the changes that happened due to the war are indeed significant. Um, and uh, these changes, they actually mean that, um, well, even if you are a strong, strong regional power um, that is uh, sort of present on the ground with the peacekeepers, uh, you uh, will not be able to ignore uh, the decisions taken in Azerbaijan. Uh, so the Azerbaijan uh, uh, will control uh, the territories that are basically crucial to uh, crucial in military terms uh, uh, to this uh, uh, remaining uh, area of Karabakh. And um, uh, that means that uh, uh, you uh, will indeed have to consult uh, the leadership of the countries involved uh, to take any further steps uh, uh, related to the future of the peacekeeping. So far, the peacekeeping is agreed for five years with the possible continuation for another five years. Uh, and uh, um, you will have to uh, have uh, both uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia, but primarily in this case, um, Azerbaijan uh, on board if you uh, want this effort to be continued, that's one. And uh, the other point here is that uh, uh, it's probably also not the Russian I uh, wish to uh, make this uh, peacekeeping effort last forever, because uh, if you make it last forever, you, um, uh, you create uh, more space for all sorts of uh, provocations and tensions and so on. Um, in terms of Russian presence in the region, you perfectly know that there is a, a Russian military base in Armenia, there are Russian border guards uh, on uh, the borders with um, um, Iran and uh, Turkey, and uh, this is not a new uh, Russian presence. Uh, this has been the Russian presence given the Russian relationship with Armenia, um, but uh, uh, to uh, keep this peacekeeping contingent sort of forever, I, I'm not sure that this, uh, this is indeed the, the Russian intention, unless uh, we sort of get to an unfortunate situation when uh, we cannot uh, have a true rapprochement in the region in spite of these uh, um, new openings that uh, exist for that uh, at this point. And uh, I just looked through uh, the Q&A section and saw that uh, um, uh, Evelyn Heindrava asked a question about uh, Iran and the Russian attitude to Iran's role. And uh, I uh, wanted to uh, address that uh, uh, given yeah. that uh, Evelyn, of course, has a, a very uh, good level of uh, expertise of his own on everything that happens in, in this region. Uh, and uh, uh, I uh, understand that uh, uh, Iran's policy has been sort of in the background of, uh, uh, of this conflict. And Iran uh, basically insisted that uh, the conflict shouldn't spread to the Iranian territory. Uh, but you have all sorts of issues, including the uh, Azeri ethnic community uh, in Iran. Uh, you have issues related to uh, the um, Iranian nuclear program and uh, the treatment of Iran by the United States. Uh, and um, I uh, think people kept in mind that there are risks uh, related not that much to uh, Iran's uh, voluntarily involvement, uh, but to a possible escalation around Iran uh, with, uh, I mean, the uh, possible uh, U.S. Uh, action uh, against Iran that uh, was uh, so much discussed uh, at some points during the uh, Trump uh, presidency, uh, that could sort of uh, involve uh, the larger region and could also influence uh, the South Caucasus. Sort of, uh, this kind of risks, I think, was uh, kept in mind uh, more than uh, any voluntarily uh, initiative by, by, by Iran to, to, to get involved in this uh, uh, Karabakh development. Uh, but uh, at this new situation that we have after the war, I think Iran uh, could actually be interested in making use of those um, economic opportunities if they appear. Um, you uh, had to have uh, every country of the region 
are very careful in what they do or rather don't do in this Karabakh area because uh, um, they all have to had to keep uh, good relations with uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and for that they had to uh, see this um, uh, Karabakh area as uh, sort of a, a black hole that they don't touch upon not to irritate anyone. And if uh, this is less of the case uh, in this uh, uh, new uh, situation, uh, then Iran and others uh, could have interest in uh, uh, reaching out with their economic activity. And we know that uh, Iran is present uh, with uh, uh, their um, uh, businessmen, with uh, their tourists uh, in uh, other parts of uh, uh, South Caucasus. Uh, uh, in some cases, this even uh, creates some level of tension, but rather tension uh, within the region, uh, not uh, tensions involving uh, Russia. So I think uh, Russia tried to uh, maintain a uh, um, much more constructive dialogue with Iran than most of uh, Western countries for a long time. And uh, uh, Russia would probably be also open to discuss with uh, Iran uh, how they see uh, their possible uh, economic involvement and their usage of uh, possible uh, new trade routes that will develop in the in the area when uh, it is indeed um, deblocked uh, with the uh, help of uh, uh, the peacekeepers and uh, uh, with the help of uh, um, uh, the Russian forces that uh, are supposed to ensure. Uh, the um, safe uh, transfer from uh, uh, Nakhichevan to mainland uh, Azerbaijan. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, very interesting discourse, actually. And thank you for taking uh, some questions yourself from uh, the Q&A. So, yeah, uh, there are still many questions and uh, I think some questions not directly relate to this uh, conflict in Karabakh, but uh, uh, one question or even two questions were relating to uh, the uh, Russian policy in Abkhazia. And uh, the last time there were discussions that maybe, uh, uh, maybe Russia will try again to revive the project of uh, uh, revitalizing the uh, railway connection uh, from Russia to Georgia through Abkhazia. Uh, and uh, of course for Georgia, uh, I think Georgia already has, uh, has shown some conditions for this kind of, uh, which were not most probably acceptable for Abkhazian side or Russian side. Uh, but there were some, some preliminary uh, exchange of ideas about it uh, years ago, few years ago, saying uh, it, it didn't uh, went uh, elsewhere. But still, now uh, this uh, could be revived. What do you think? Uh, uh, what are the prospects for such, such developments? Uh, Georgia has certain concerns regarding this because the trust uh, is very low uh, as regards to Russia. It's uh, so in Georgia. Uh, its uh, dominating view of this is that Russia would use this kind of uh, railway for uh, increasing leverage and influence over Georgia, first of all, and second, it's for uh, military and uh, some other uh, reasons that for uh, to, to prepare it for, for again for the next uh, wave of aggression, etc. Uh, but still, uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, would Russia be thinking or interested in? Uh, reopening this Abkhazian railway, uh, we, which goes through Georgia to Iran, Armenia, and, uh, and then uh, reopens all, all kinds of links in South Caucasus. Well, um, of course, it's a, it's a tricky issue, and I, I, I know that uh, it um, exists, but uh, I think uh, the question is rather uh, whether we can expect uh, um, more interest on the Georgian side, uh, because uh, um, of course uh, all the political disagreements that exist between Russia and Georgia, uh, they are not to go away, they are not to disappear. Uh, and uh, the developments around Karabakh, they um, influence very little um, uh, the state of affairs in this regard. 
uh, but uh, sometimes uh, you uh, may uh, find um, uh, solutions for those infrastructural connections uh, that uh, uh, sort of help you um, circumvent uh, uh, the political issues. But this only happens uh, when uh, uh, countries that are involved are truly economically interested in that. And uh, I understand that uh, there were different opinions in Georgia, at least uh, until this day, um, on uh, uh, whether this is even economically uh, beneficial for Georgia, uh, whether uh, this uh, uh, would uh, play a positive role, even if all the political concerns are sort of sidelined. And uh, uh, there was uh, no positive yes uh, answer to that in Georgia. Uh, so the question is uh, uh, whether this will be uh, different now. And uh, the question is probably uh, sort of secondary uh, in comparison to uh, the questions that I posed earlier. So sort of if, if you um, find uh, indeed the possibility uh, to restore uh, trade connections, infrastructural connections, and uh, economic activity that did not exist uh, to uh, the uh, south of Georgia before the uh, latest developments around Karabakh, um, then uh, you may answer this uh, question about uh, about Abkhazia as 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 the next one. Sort of, if if you do have uh, the economic activity restored. Uh, this might uh, create a different rationale for uh, Georgia and Russia to uh, look at this issue again closely. Uh, but if uh, uh, this restoration of economic ties remains rather uh, a wish uh, than the reality, then nothing will change also with regard to uh, the railroad and other possible connections. Um, of course, uh, it's, it's uh, not easy for Russia and Georgia, given uh, the absence of diplomatic relations, even to uh, talk to one another on, on serious projects. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and we also saw quite some negative trends in Russian-Georgian relationship with the uh, uh, flights, uh, um, regular flights that uh, were canceled yet before the pandemic. And now you have uh, people, uh, because of the pandemic, traveling even less than they did uh, um, uh, in the absence of regular flights. Um, uh, so to resolve all this uh, huge number of issues, Russia and Georgia would need a very serious uh, uh, dialogue and uh, a different level of trust that they did not demonstrate so far. Um, so I cannot exclude that uh, we will see some evolution in this regard, but I wouldn't put my bets on uh, this evolution to um, be a fast one. Uh, I'm not sure that we can expect any quick developments here. Kaka, turn, turn on your, your mic. Your mic, your microphone is off. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, uh, I say that we are approaching the end of our meeting, but still, uh, still maybe uh, we could we could still uh, discuss uh, a few topics uh, uh, shortly, uh, and not uh, uh, spending too much time on each. Uh, uh, there was a question about this social economic space that Russia intends to create with Abkhazia. So it's not Karabakh again issue, but it's uh, the regional issue and the behavior of Russia and the intentions of Russia in uh, South Caucasus. Uh, uh, for us, it's uh, of course very important issue because uh, uh, this may smell like uh, the attempt to integrate more Abkhazia, and, uh, Abkhazia into Russian space. Uh, how would you would you evaluate this attempt? So, what what really are behind of this? Because in Georgia, it, it was considered as a uh, uh, next step towards the annexation of Abkhazia. So, uh, practically, Anschluss or uh, 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 merging Abkhazia with with Russia, because it's it's a type of. Uh, 
in a sectoral integration or integration uh, saying uh, step by step uh, of Abkhazia with Russia. How you consider this, this new, uh, new type of agreement between Abkhazia and de facto uh, leaders and uh, <clears throat> government and, uh, and the Russian government? Well, uh, I might be missing some significant uh, details of uh, what uh, has been happening on the ground there, but uh, everything I heard about um, uh, Abkhazia tells me that uh, they uh, didn't really have a wish of being just uh, of becoming part of Russia. Uh, they uh, wanted to uh, maintain as a um, standalone entity, as uh, their own um, um, sovereign country, uh, and um, uh, of course, it's a very painful issue for for Georgia. Uh, but uh, I think what we can see in this uh, in in this discussion of uh, economic communication between uh, uh, Abkhazia and and Russia and what is uh, very sort of hard uh, to accept politically for for Georgia is that uh, um, Russia officially treats Abkhazia as a, as a sovereign state. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this is on a very serious note. So you have uh, all sorts of treaties uh, being concluded, uh, bilateral relations, you have uh, um, diplomatic communication, and you also have uh, economic arrangements that you might have with uh, some other uh, country in the world. Um, and um, that is, of course, uh, something that uh, I understand uh, People in Georgia, um, at least many, uh, prefer to see as a sort of uh, a temporary uh, thing related to uh, the political course of uh, uh, the uh, current uh, Russian government. Uh, but um, I struggle to see uh, a possibility how this uh, course could just be uh, reverted. Uh, in uh, this sense, uh, if you look from a point of the official Russia, uh, the uh, events of uh, 2008, there was sort of a point of no return. And beyond this point, uh, what the Russian government expects and uh, what's very hard to achieve uh, is that um, uh, Tbilisi at some point comes to the conclusion that uh, they do need to establish uh, uh, proper relationship and communication with the uh, Sukhumi and Tsingmali, uh, rather than uh, um, uh, they, the, 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 those, uh, those, those um, um, uh, countries, uh, they uh, would sort of uh, uh, disappear and get back to Georgia. Um, so uh, again, this, this issue is a very painful one, but uh, I'm just, um, uh, telling you how I see that, that um, from the official Russian point, uh, this is just a, a similar kind of development of economic relationship that they could have with um, uh, Serbia or some other uh, friendly countries. And that doesn't mean that uh, these um, uh, countries are uh, about to integrate into Russia. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, very interesting views. And uh, uh, there are so many uh, issues that could be discussed around this um, uh, this uh, situation, which which has been created in uh, the South Caucasus, and about Russia's role and uh, the Russia's views. Uh, I really appreciate really appreciate your. Uh, intervention and your uh, sincere uh, attitude, your sincere uh, responses on all questions. Uh, I think that you covered, there were more than 13 questions now hanging, but uh, I think on majority of them, you already gave uh, your response. So there is no need to repeat them. Uh, if there is anything that you could, that you would desire to, to say in addition, uh, out of the scope of these questions, maybe, but related, of course, to the subject, uh, that would be a very much interesting. And please go ahead. 
and then we can conclude, uh, we can resume our meeting. Well, I, I would probably just add that uh, um, oh, it's a, an obvious thing for people who follow the developments in the region that um, on the one hand, uh, it's uh, not easy to uh, be a sort of a straightforward optimist uh, when uh, you follow the developments in uh, the South Caucasus over the years and uh, you have many uh, conflictual relationships uh, lasting for decades and decades, if not centuries. Um, on uh, the other hand, uh, uh, what do you understand when you look at the region is that uh, even with uh, all those um, uh, difficult relationships, uh, uh, the uh, countries that are present here and uh, ethnic communities that often uh, uh, cross the borders of countries, uh, they um, remain neighbors to each other uh, over many centuries as well. Uh, and uh, um, that uh, should be at least one reason for them uh, to uh, never just uh, uh, look up in uh, the uh, animosities that uh, exist uh, and uh, not to reach out to each other and not to try to uh, talk to each other in spite of um, uh, disagreements. Um, we uh, just uh, uh, saw this uh, this uh, uh, war that um, uh, is uh, in the end uh, a human tragedy uh, and not just a shift in uh, you know geopolitical uh, uh, fault lines. Uh, uh, it's um, uh, a tragedy for many people, and it's uh, another reminder uh, that uh, even when you have uh, parties uh, talking to each other at the negotiations table for many, many years, uh, it's uh, not the worst option. Uh, the worst option is uh, the military one because it leads to um, um, people dying, uh, very often very young people dying. Um, uh, so I think uh, it's just another reminder on how careful we should be uh, tackling various issues that still exist uh, in, the, in the region. And I hope that uh, our decision makers who are not always um, uh, uh, at the level of peacefulness demonstrated by the experts community, unfortunately, um, our decision makers uh, will be um, at the level of responsibility that will let us uh, avoid uh, uh, further wars in, in this region. If we manage at least that, I think uh, we will already be on the right path. Well, thank you very much once again, Sergei. Uh, yes, uh, really. Uh, first of all, I wish you and all participants and thanks a lot for uh, participants who who were carefully listening and uh, posing uh, 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 <clears throat> their questions. And uh, of course, to all of them, first of all, I wish uh, good health. So let's, uh, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to the time when uh, at least this pandemic will uh, stop. <laughs> and one, one problem less, so we can go more carefully and more uh, with more energy towards those problems which we are discussing now here, to regional problems, to the problems of relations between uh, uh, neighboring states, neighboring nations, and uh, looking forward towards the establishing of uh, uh, really uh, justice and peace in, in, our, in our region and common, common space. So thank you very much and uh, all the best to you and to all our participants. Thank you.